Hi, everybody. Well, it's late at night. It is 1.30 in the morning here. My hair is a mess because it's wet. I just had a shower not that long ago, so, yeah. This is how crappy I look with wet hair. <laughs> but I don't care. <laughs> I thought I'd try something different, and um, I'm going to give you a sample of it in this video. And if anybody has an interest in it, let me know in the comments. Um, I actually find this very interesting, and I had a fairly good response about the the book that I had bought the other day. Um, on the actual events of the 49ers as they came across. Anyways, I have these books that I bought back in 81 on a trip to Oregon. And the books are uh, actual interviews that um, were done in... 1920s around there of uh, people who were actual pioneers of the time that came across on the plains and of course at this point they were you know quite a bit older uh, most of the people that they interviewed of course had been children at the time and these are their stories now some of the stories are pretty tragic. <laughs> Some of them are very dramatic. Some are fun. Um, you know, it, it ranges. And I figured that I shouldn't have any problem reading this book in the sense of copyright or something like that. Because this is these are just actual things that have been, been had been originally published in a newspaper. So I'm going to read one of them to you. And like I said, if if you're interested in it, let me know, because uh, I I really found these stories fascinating. Let's see if I can I can see better now. This story is told by Matilda Jane Sager Delaney. Okay. They say that I'm hard and bitter. If some of the people who have life made easy for them had been through what I have. Maybe they would feel bitter and vindictive, too. Nowadays, the child is everything. When I was young, children had no rights. They were to be seen, not heard, and to be seen as little as possible. I wrote a book recently entitled The Whitman Massacre. If I had had my way, I would have told some wholesome truths. But my friends told me to bury the hatchet. To forgive and forget. I suppose we should forgive, but the good book doesn't say you have to forget. And as long as I live, I shall never forget the injustice and indignities and cruelty I had to suffer when I was a helpless little child. When you think of those old missionaries, you're apt to think of them as saintly, long-suffering, charitable people easy to get along with. But if you had to live with them as I have, you would have another think coming. No, I'm not referring to Dr. Marcus Whitman and Mrs. Whitman. I am thinking of the people who, after the Whitmans were murdered, took us out of charity and worked us to the limit to get their money's worth out of us. By the way, this is the book that I'm reading. It's well worn because... I have read this book a lot. <laughs> I was born at St. Joseph, Missouri on October 16, 1839. I was four and a half years old when we started for Oregon. My father, Henry Sager, and my mother, Naomi Sager, died of mountain fever while we were on the journey. We seven children were cared for by the other immigrants. Captain Shaw asked the Whitmans to take care of us. 
Not many, many families wanted to adopt seven orphan children they had never seen before. Would you? Dr. Whitman did. I wish I could give you a picture of the Whitman mission, of the family life of the Whitmans, of the morning and the evening prayers, and of the work the Indians of the immigrant uh, of the Indians of the immigrants who stayed over that winter and the following winter of the bathing in the river and of summer of our walks with Miss Whitman of the gathering of wild flowers of our simple meals of driving the cows to pasture of the routine of work and all the rest of it. I have something that kept them. There we go. So make sure it's recording. Mrs. Whitman believed in yay, yay, and nay, nay. She would point to one of us and then point to the dishes or the broom, and they would jump and get busy with our assigned tasks. She didn't scold much, but we dreaded that accusing finger pointing at us. The way we jumped when it was leveled at us, you would have thought it was a gun. It was likely to go off. She had the New England idea of strict discipline, and there was no danger of any of us becoming spoiled. She was a good woman, and Dr. Whitman was a man you could not help respecting and admiring. The events on November 29, 1847, when our foster parents, Dr. and Mrs. Whitman, and my two brothers were killed, as well as many others at the mission, I shall pass over. After Peter Skeen Ogden bought us from the Indians, we were taken to Fort Walla Walla, the Hudson's Bay Company's post, now called Wulula. From there, we went in open boats down the Columbian River to Fort Vancouver, and thence to Oregon City. I stayed with the Spaldings that winter and went to Mrs. J. Quinton Thornton's private school. The next spring, the Reverend J. S. Griffin and Alvin T. Smith of Forest Grove came with their ox teams and took us to Forest Grove. A few days later, I was taken by a family who had a farm nearby. They lived in a one-room cabin. All the cooking was done on, on the fireplace. Sometimes the coals did not last overnight, so I'd be sent a mile or more to a neighbor's to get a shovel full of hot coals to rebuild the fire. Things were crude in those days. I remember the woman I stayed with walking the floor with a toothache. They cured her toothache by knocking the tooth out of, of the steel punch. Her husband was an intensely religious man. Many of the religious people of that day were harsh, uncharitable, and intolerant. He wouldn't let me go to school at Forest Grove because he had fallen out with some of the people over their religious differences. There was too much church... <laughs> Christianity, too little Christianity. For the same reason, he would not let me go to the church or Sunday school. The verses in the Bible he pinned his faith to was the one that says, If you spare the rod, you spoil the child. He did his full duty to me in that respect. For several years, I was never without welts or black and blue marks from constant beatings. I remember once he was going away on a trip. He told me to go get a thick-cut switch. I thought he wanted it for his horse, as he was saddling up. I brought the switch. He called to me and seized me by the shoulder, gave me an unmerciful beating. I said, what have I done? He said, you haven't done anything. I'm going away, and the chances are you will do something to deserve a beating while I am gone, and I won't be here to give it to you. So I will see to my duty before leaving. Mounting his horse, he said, I will whip you as soon as I return. But if you do anything to deserve a beating, 
I will give you one you won't forget in a hurry. Catherine, my eldest sister, who was thirteen, was asked for by a preacher at Salem, as she was the most useful. H. H. Spaulding, who had charge of us, said whoever took her would have to take the baby, Henrietta, who was less than four years old. He agreed to take both of them. He had not had them long before he gave the little girl away. The people who took her gave her to someone else, and she went from family to family till finally we heard someone had taken her to California. We didn't have letters and telegrams in those days, so it took me months to get word from each other. I once paid 50 cents for a letter. We heard that our baby sister was killed in California, but we never heard the particulars. I was eight years old when the Whitman massacre happened. After a few months, I was given to a family near the Forest Grove, and in the fall of 1848, the man went to the gold diggings in California. He returned in the spring of 1849. While he was gone, his wife, their little baby, and I lived with Reverend J. Cornwell. He was a good man, according to his lights. He was unbusinesslike and unpractical. For example, he took a band of sheep late in the fall with the understanding that for their care, he was to have half the increase. He did not have any hay or feed for the sheep, so while he was away preaching that winter, the ewes starved or froze to death. His son George and his daughter Narcissa and I did the work of the farm and the house. The wolves were very hungry that winter, and they used to come all around the house to get the sheep. The country was unfenced, and the long-horned and almost all wild Spanish cattle roamed at will over the country. When I went on errands, I was afraid of them, for they would often tree people on foot and wait for hours at the foot of the tree. If you walked in the heavy timber, you were afraid of the wolves, while if you walked in the open, the cattle would see you and run after you. Mrs. Cornwall spent every moment she could spare in carding and spinning wool and knitting wool socks, which she sold to the miners for a dollar a pair. If she hadn't, we would have gone hungry. The winter was cold and the sheep died or were frozen to death. It was my job to pull the wool off the sheep that died and wash it in the creek, doing the family washing in the stream by beating the clothes with a paddle on a log and rinsing them in the cold water was hard. But washing the dirt and grease out of that wool was a job that was heartbreaking for a little girl nine years old. In the spring of 1850, I had three months schooling. Mr. Eels taught me, <coughs> excuse me, taught me the school. Now I'm reading this the way it's written, just so you know. Um, <laughs> it is written a little different because of the era taught me the school, and I walked three and a half miles to and from school. From the time I was eight until I was fifteen, I was whipped so much that I had the feeling about it as one does the winter rain that is inevitable and was to be borne without complaint, for nothing could be done about it. Some of the whippings became of their severity stand out in my because of their severity stand out in my memory. I remember a whipping that I got that was unusually severe for going to an entertainment given at a congregational church at Forest Grove. The man I was staying with said it was ungodly and would teach me to deserve worldly amusements and the next thing I might want to do, want to go to a regular theater and that that was the gateway to hell and damnation. Another severe beating I got was for going with a girl of my own age. Her name was Mary Allen. She had been born out of wedlock, so I was whipped for going with her. When she was 13, a man named Adam Whipple married her. He was 35 when he married her. He killed her within a year and set fire to the house to keep people from knowing he had killed her. Neighbors saw the fire, pulled it out, and found her body and saw that she had been killed. Whipple was hanged at Dallas Dally's early in October 1852. I remember one time the man I lived with taught, 
caught his saddle horse, saddled it, and rode up to the cabin, called me out. He told me to get my sunbonnet and to get behind, on behind him, as he wanted me to go to Hillsboro with him. Children didn't ask questions in those days. They obeyed orders. As we rode to Hillboro, I wondered all the way why he wanted me to go with him. We rode there to where a crowd had assembled. Presently, the officers brought out a man and hanged him. I was horrified. He said, I bought, brought you here to see the hanging to impress on your mind what happens to people who do not mind their elders and do exactly what they are told. It took me months to forget that horrible sight. I had seen when the Indians killed Dr. and Mrs. Whitman, and my brothers, and others, and now for weeks I woke up at night covered with sweat of terror at seeing the man hanged in my dreams. I could see him twitch and his tongue hang out and his protruding eyes. Childhood was a time of terror and bitterness when I was a girl. I was whipped so much that the neighbors finally complained, and they had me summoned to give evidence before the judge. The man I lived with said the neighbors should mind their own business, and then he could discipline me more effectively if the judge could bind me out to him until I was sixteen. The judge was willing, but there was a dispute about my age. While they were settling that, I married a miner from Shasta County, California, and went to the gold mines with him. He was 31. I was 15. His name was I. M. Hazelett. During the next eight years, I had five children. Mr. Hazelett died, and I took in Washington to support myself and my children. Several years later, I married Matthew Fultz. We had three children. We moved to Farmington, Washington, and Mr. Fultz started a livery stable. He also bought a furniture store and an undertaking business and ran a hotel. He died, and I had to take care of all of the different business enterprises. A few years after Mr. Fultz's death, I married Daniel De Delaney, and for the past few years, I have lived with my children. And that was... The Oregon Journal, December 24th to the 25th in 1921. So let me know what you think. Like I said, they're shorter stories. That was one of the longer ones, but that was the first one in the book. And if you like it, I'll read more. Um, I find them interesting because you're listening to actual facts of actual events by the people who actually lived it, not some made-up Hollywood Thing. That's it for tonight. <laughs> so, uh, until tomorrow, have a good day, good evening, and I'll talk to you then. Bye.